the night was always still in the new house. Not the comforting kind of stillness, but the kind that clawed at the edges of consciousness. The creaks of the floorboards had a life of their own, like unseen feet padding down the halls. Emily tried to shake it off as nerves. Moving into a new place was supposed to be exciting, wasn't it? But the moment they moved in, she felt it. An unease, a suffocating weight that lingered around every corner. She brushed it off as stress. After all, unpacking an entire house was exhausting, and the sleepless nights that followed weren't helping. But there was something else. Something gnawing at her. The first time it happened, she had chalked it up to a nightmare. Waking in the dead of night, her body rigid, paralyzed, as though every muscle had been locked in place. Her mind screamed to move, but she couldn't. Her bedroom was bathed in soft shadows, illuminated only by the pale glow of the moon filtering through the blinds. But that's when she noticed it. In the corner of the room, just where the darkness seemed to deepen, stood a figure. It wasn't clear, just a vague shape, but Emily could feel it, feel its eyes, feel the cold that radiated from it. Her heart pounded in her chest, yet her body refused to respond. She tried to scream, to cry out for her husband lying next to her, but no sound came. The figure didn't move, didn't make a sound, but she knew without a doubt that it was watching her. And then, as quickly as it had started, the paralysis released her. Emily bolted upright, her breaths ragged and shallow, sweat soaking through her nightshirt. She looked around wildly, her eyes darting to the corner where the figure had stood, but there was nothing, just shadows. It was a dream, she whispered to herself, hugging her knees to her chest, feeling the cool breeze from the open window. Just a dream. But the clock beside her bed flashed 3.07 a.m. The night felt colder than it should have. The next few days passed uneventfully. She mentioned nothing to her husband, Greg. He wouldn't understand. He was a man of logic, of reason. The house had quirks, he said, but nothing to be afraid of. Emily tried to convince herself he was right. That is, until it happened again. A week later, at 3 a.m. sharp, the same thing. The same paralysis. The same dark figure. This time, it was closer. It stood at the foot of her bed, its shape more defined. She couldn't see a face, only the silhouette, but the air felt thick with malice. She wanted to scream, to thrash, to move, but her body betrayed her. The figure leaned forward slightly, its presence more menacing than before. The clock ticked in the background, marking the passing minutes, until finally, as if snapping out of a trance, her body released. She shot up in bed, gasping for breath, her hands trembling. She looked toward Greg, who slept soundly oblivious to her terror. She didn't sleep for the rest of the night. Days bled into nights, and the unease in the house seemed to grow. Emily began avoiding going to bed, spending late hours watching television or mindlessly scrolling through her phone, too afraid of what awaited her at 3 a.m. Then the third night arrived. She had forced herself into bed, her exhaustion finally outweighing her fear. But deep down, she knew. When the clock ticked closer to three, she could feel the shift in the air, the temperature dropped, the stillness more profound than usual. Her eyes flickered open, and there it was again. The figure. Closer now, it stood at her bedside, looming over her, its shadow stretching across her frozen body. Emily's heart raced in her chest, her pulse drumming in her ears. She could feel its breath, cold and damp, brushing against her skin. A faint whisper echoed in her mind, though she couldn't make out the words. It was trying to speak to her. She fought against the paralysis, Desperate to move, but the more she resisted, the more her body refused to obey. Her mind screamed for help, but there was no one to save her. The clock read 3.05 a.m. The figure moved. Its form seemed to shift, its presence more intrusive, more tangible. Emily could feel it now, its malevolence, its hunger. She realized with a jolt of horror that it wasn't just watching her anymore. It wanted her. It was getting closer every night, and she knew without a doubt that one. Emily's days were becoming a blur of exhaustion and dread. Every night she fought sleep, but no matter how long she resisted, the clock always ticked closer to 3 a.m., and every night the dark figure appeared again, standing over her, drawing nearer. She couldn't tell Greg. Not really. How could she explain that something was invading their bedroom every night, that something was trying to possess her? He had dismissed it once as nightmares, and she knew he would dismiss it again. But she could feel it. Whatever it was, it was real, and it was coming for her. 
One evening, after another sleepless night, Emily sat at the kitchen table with her hands wrapped around a steaming mug of coffee. The sunlight streaming through the window did little to calm her frayed nerves. She stared blankly ahead, barely hearing the soft hum of Greg talking on the phone in the other room. She hadn't told him she was waking up every single night now, always at the same time, always to the same figure. How could she? She was beginning to question her own sanity. The coffee turned cold in her hands before she finally rose, pacing the length of the room. What was she supposed to do? She couldn't keep living like this. Her phone buzzed on the counter, jolting her from her thoughts. She glanced at the screen, a message from her sister, Claire. You settling in okay? We need to come visit soon. Miss you. A thought crept into Emily's mind. Claire had always been a skeptic of the supernatural, but she wouldn't dismiss her outright, not like Greg. Maybe she could talk to her. She texted back, her fingers shaking slightly. Something weird's been happening. Can we talk later? Almost immediately, Claire responded. Sure. Call me whenever. That night, Emily found herself staring at the ceiling again, counting down the minutes to 3 a.m. She had spent the entire day trying to come up with an explanation for what was happening, but there was none. Um, she had even searched the house top to bottom looking for anything, anything, that might explain why she felt so uneasy. Nothing seemed out of place, but the air in the house felt heavy, like a presence she couldn't shake. Greg had fallen asleep early, his soft snores filling the room. Emily envied his ability to sleep so easily, so soundly. The hours ticked by, and she felt the now familiar cold seep into the room as the clock neared the faded hour. Her eyes darted toward the bedside clock. 2.59. She clenched her fists, her heart already racing in anticipation. She knew what was coming. Every muscle in her body tensed, but she couldn't move. She couldn't do anything to stop it. 3 a.m. It began. Her limbs felt impossibly heavy, her chest constricted as if an invisible force was pressing down on her. Her breath hitched in her throat as her gaze was drawn, helplessly, toward the dark corner of the room. It was there. But this time, this time, it was different. The figure wasn't standing still. It was moving. Slowly, deliberately, its shadowy form drifted toward her. Emily's pulse spiked and she tried to scream, but no sound escaped her lips. The figure stood at the foot of the bed now, and she could feel its presence more than ever before, a suffocating, overwhelming pressure as if the air itself had turned hostile. Her vision blurred as the dark figure seemed to grow taller, its shape distorting, flickering in and out of the shadows. Emily's chest tightened painfully, and a new terror gripped her. This time it wasn't just standing over her, this time it was bending closer. Its face, though still shrouded in darkness, was now inches from her own. She could feel the cold, damp breath against her cheek. She could feel it. Inside her head. A voice. No, not a voice, but a sensation. Whispered in her mind. Something ancient, malevolent. She couldn't make out the words, but she knew it was trying to speak to her. Trying to. Take her. Emily's eyes darted toward Greg, still asleep beside her, completely unaware of the danger. She wanted to call for him, but her lips refused to move. The paralysis was stronger this time, more suffocating. The figure's presence was overwhelming her, invading her thoughts. Then suddenly, she felt a pressure on her chest, like icy fingers pressing against her skin. The figure's hand, it was reaching out, touching her. Her heart pounded in her ears, the terror clawing at her throat. She couldn't move. She couldn't fight back. The clock blinked. 3.06 a.m. Just as Emily thought she couldn't bear it anymore, just as she felt her mind slipping away, the figure recoiled. Its dark form shimmered, as though disturbed by something unseen. Her body snapped back to life, and she bolted upright, gasping for air. Her hand flew to her chest, feeling for the spot where the figure had touched her. But there was nothing. No mark, no sign of what had just happened. Greg stirred beside her, groggy but unaware. Emily? What's wrong? She stared at him, shaking, her voice barely above a whisper. It, it was closer this time. It touched me, Greg. He frowned, still half asleep. You're just having bad dreams, Em. You need rest. But Emily knew it wasn't a dream. It was real, and it was getting stronger. She glanced at the clock, 3.07 a.m. It was coming for her. The morning after, Emily felt like a ghost of herself. She hadn't slept at all after the, the encounter. Her body too rattled, her mind spinning with what had happened. Every time she closed her eyes, she could feel the figure's cold touch pressing against her chest, could feel its presence inside her mind. Greg left for work 
still convinced that it was all just a bad string of nightmares. He'd kissed her goodbye, told her to take it easy, but his words felt hollow. He didn't understand. How could he? He hadn't felt what she'd felt. Emily grabbed her phone and walked to the living room, her fingers trembling as she dialed her sister's number. The moment Claire picked up, Emily felt her throat tighten. She hadn't realized how desperate she was until she heard her sister's voice. Hey Em, what's going on? You sounded off in your text. Emily swallowed hard, her voice barely steady. Claire, something's wrong, really wrong. There was a pause on the other end. What do you mean? Did something happen at the house? Emily hesitated, unsure how to even begin. It's been happening at night. I wake up around 3 a.m., but I, I can't move. There's this figure, this shadow. It's been standing over me, and last night, it touched me, Claire. I could feel it trying to, trying to get inside me. The silence that followed was suffocating. Emily could hear Claire processing, probably trying to find the right words. After what felt like an eternity, her sister spoke. Em, are you sure it's not just sleep paralysis? That can cause some really vivid hallucinations. I've read about it. It can feel like there's someone in the room. No. Emily's voice came out sharper than she intended. This isn't some hallucination. This, this thing is real, Claire. I know it. Claire's tone softened. Okay, okay, I believe you. But maybe you should talk to someone, like a sleep specialist or... Claire, please. Emily's desperation bled through the phone. I need help. I don't know what to do. A long pause followed before Claire finally spoke again. Look, why don't I come over? I can stay the night and we'll figure this out together. Maybe I'll see something too. Emily felt a surge of relief. Yes, please, just... I can't do this alone. Okay, I'll be there tonight, Claire promised. We'll get through this, Em. That evening, the sun dipped behind the horizon, casting long shadows across the house. Emily and Claire sat in the living room, the weight of the coming night hanging over them. Claire tried to keep things light, cracking jokes and talking about mundane things, but Emily could see the unease in her sister's eyes. Even Claire, the eternal skeptic, could feel the tension in the air. They stayed up late, waiting for the dreaded hour. Emily felt a gnawing anxiety build in her chest as the minutes slipped away. Greg had gone to bed hours ago, none the wiser, leaving the two sisters alone to face whatever was coming. At 2.45 a.m., Emily couldn't sit still any longer. She paced the living room, wringing her hands. Claire watched her silently, her expression a mix of concern and confusion. Do you really think it'll happen again tonight? Claire asked, her voice quiet. Emily stopped pacing and turned to her, eyes wide. It always happens, every night. The clock struck 3 a.m., and it began. Emily's body froze in place, her breath hitched, her muscles locking in an all-too-familiar paralysis. She tried to speak to warn Claire, but her throat wouldn't cooperate. It was happening, just like every other night, only this time she wasn't alone. Claire shot up from the couch, alarmed. Emily, what's wrong? But Emily couldn't respond. Her eyes darted wildly, trying to look around the room. She could feel it. The figure was there, the air in the room growing heavier, colder. Claire stepped toward her, her eyes wide with confusion. Emily, you're scaring me, say something! But then Claire's expression changed. Her eyes flicked to the corner of the room, where the shadows seemed to be gathering, twisting unnaturally. Her face paled. She saw it. Claire saw the figure, too. Oh my god, Claire whispered, stepping back. What? What is that? The shadow moved, coiling itself like a living thing. Emily's heart pounded in her chest, terror clawing at her insides. The figure was moving again, stepping out from the corner, its dark form more solid, more menacing. Claire let out a small, involuntary gasp. The figure was closer than ever before. It stood right beside Emily now, towering over her, its face still obscured by darkness. Claire rushed toward Emily, her hands shaking as she grabbed her shoulders. Emily, please, just move. But Emily couldn't. The figure leaned in, its cold presence suffocating her. She could feel its breath against her neck, the same damp, icy sensation that had haunted her every night. Her vision blurred, and she felt her mind slipping, being pulled into the dark void where the figure dwelled. Emily, no, Claire screamed, shaking her sister violently, trying to pull her free from whatever was holding her. And then, in a sudden rush, the figure vanished. The shadows dispersed as if they had never been there. Emily collapsed to the floor, gasping for breath, her body finally her own again. Claire knelt beside her, her face pale and her hands trembling. 
I saw it, she whispered, her voice thick with fear. I saw it too. Emily looked up at her, her breath ragged. It's getting closer, she choked out. It's trying to take me. Claire stared at her in horror, realization dawning on her face. We have to stop it, Em. We have to stop it before it takes you. But how? The morning after Claire witnessed the figure, the weight of what had happened pressed heavily on both sisters. The house, once merely unsettling, now felt oppressive. Every corner seemed to hide some lurking shadow. Every creak of the floorboards, a reminder of the dark presence that had nearly claimed Emily the night before. Claire paced back and forth in the kitchen, her coffee untouched. I don't understand it. I thought this was all in your head, Em, but I saw it. I felt it. That thing, whatever it is, it's real. Emily sat at the table, her hands wrapped tightly around the mug in front of her, though she hadn't taken a sip. She looked drained, her eyes hollow from the weeks of restless nights. I told you, it's been getting closer every night. It's not just some hallucination. It's trying to take me. I can feel it inside me. Claire shuddered at the thought, her mind racing to find some solution, some way to protect her sister. We can't just sit here and wait for it to come again. We need to do something. But what? I've tried everything. Greg thinks I'm just having nightmares. I even thought about seeing a doctor, but what can they do for something like this? Emily's voice was thick with frustration and fear. Claire stood still for a moment, deep in thought. There's got to be something we're missing. Maybe this house, maybe it's the house itself. Emily looked up, her brow furrowed. What do you mean? Claire grabbed her phone, her fingers flying across the screen. I'm going to look into this place. Maybe something happened here before you moved in. Maybe that thing is connected to the house. There has to be a reason it's only happening to you since you got here. Emily nodded weakly, a small spark of hope kindling inside her. If there's something, anything, we have to find it. I can't survive another night like this. For the rest of the day, the two sisters worked in silence, scouring the internet for any information they could find about the house, its previous owners, or any strange occurrences. Hours passed, the sun beginning to set outside, casting long shadows across the room as the tension built. Finally, Claire gasped, her eyes wide as she stared at her screen. I found something. Emily rushed to her side. What is it? Claire hesitated, her voice low as she began to read. The house was owned by a couple about 15 years ago. A man and a woman. They seemed normal, but according to some old newspaper clippings, the wife began to suffer from some condition. The neighbors said she would wake up in the middle of the night, screaming about a dark figure standing over her. They thought she was losing her mind, and then one night she disappeared. Emily's breath caught in her throat. Disappeared? What happened to her? Claire scrolled down further. No one knows. The husband claimed he woke up one morning and she was just gone. The police never found any evidence of foul play, but rumors spread that something had happened in the house, something supernatural. Emily's hands shook as she processed what Claire was saying. That can't be a coincidence. She was going through the same thing I am, and then she vanished. Claire nodded grimly. It sounds exactly like what's been happening to you. But if she didn't make it, M, we need to find a way to stop this before it gets you too. Emily's stomach twisted with fear. Every part of her wanted to run, to leave the house and never look back. But something deep inside told her it wouldn't be that easy. The figure wasn't just tied to the house anymore. It had latched onto her. Leaving wouldn't change that. As the night approached, they prepared as best they could. Claire insisted on staying up with Emily, refusing to let her face the dark alone. They moved into the living room, both too afraid to sleep in the bedroom where the figure had first appeared. The clock ticked closer to 3 a.m. and the air grew thick with tension. The house seemed to hold its breath, as if waiting for what was to come. Emily's heart raced in her chest, her palms clammy as she clung to the blanket draped over her shoulders. Claire sat beside her, a protective hand on her knee, both of them silently dreading the inevitable. 2.58. 2.59. The atmosphere in the room shifted. The temperature dropped suddenly the warmth from the fireplace all but disappearing. Emily's body tensed as the familiar paralysis took hold, her muscles locking into place. Claire looked at her with wide, panicked eyes. Emily? No, not again. Claire shook her sister, but Emily couldn't respond. Her eyes flicked wildly around the room, searching for the figure. 
She knew it was there. She could feel it. The clock hit 3 a.m. and the figure appeared. This time, it didn't waste any time lurking in the shadows. The dark silhouette materialized in the center of the room, more solid, more real than ever before. Its shape loomed over them, a towering mass of darkness that radiated cold and malice. Claire's breath caught in her throat. Oh my God, it's here. Emily's eyes were wide with terror as the figure moved closer. It was no longer content to stand and watch. It was reaching for her, its long, shadowy arms stretching toward her body. She could feel its pull, the deep, suffocating sensation of being drawn into its void. Claire. Emily's mind screamed, though her lips remained frozen in place. Claire, acting on instinct, grabbed a candle from the nearby mantel and thrust it toward the figure. The light from the flame flickered wildly, but it didn't touch the dark mass. The figure remained, undeterred, inching closer. Claire's voice cracked as she yelled, No, you can't have her! But the figure moved with a single-minded purpose, reaching for Emily with its dark, icy tendrils. She felt it again, the cold breath, the oppressive weight. It was wrapping itself around her, pulling her deeper into the darkness. This time, she couldn't escape. The clock read 3.05 a.m. The figure's touch was ice cold, and Emily could feel her mind slipping away, a deep sense of dread overwhelming her. It was taking her just as it had taken the woman before her. There was no stopping it. Claire screamed, her voice piercing the darkness. Emily, no. The room trembled, the figure recoiling slightly as the sound of Claire's voice echoed through the house. The tremor that shook the house after Claire's scream seemed to ripple through the very foundation. The figure hesitated, its dark form wavering, almost as if it had been startled by the defiance in Claire's voice. Emily, still locked in paralysis, could feel the oppressive force loosening its grip ever so slightly. The icy tendrils that had begun to wrap around her recoiled, retreating for a moment, but the dark figure wasn't done. Claire's heart raced as she watched the shadow pull back, and for the first time since this nightmare began, she felt something shift. Hope. She didn't know what was happening, but she had rattled the thing, even if just for a second. It wasn't invincible. She grabbed Emily's hand, squeezing tightly. Em, stay with me. Don't let it take you. Emily's eyes flicked toward her sister, desperation written all over her face. She couldn't move, couldn't speak, but the presence of Claire beside her, the sheer will in her voice, gave her a sliver of strength. The figure shifted again, regaining its form, its towering shadow darkening the room. The temperature dropped once more, the air thickening as it advanced, but Claire wasn't backing down. We're not letting you have her. Claire screamed, her voice raw, her grip on Emily's hand tightening, as if she could hold her sister back from the abyss by force alone. The dark figure paused, as though considering Claire's defiance. Then, slowly, it extended a single, elongated hand toward Claire. The air around her turned frigid, her breath fogging in front of her face. For a moment, she felt the cold fingers of the figure press against her skin, the same icy dread that had gripped Emily now passing through her body. It was as if it was trying to make a choice whether to take her instead. Claire's mind raced. If the figure could be affected by her voice, maybe there was something more she could do. Something that could banish it for good. Her eyes darted to the living room table where her phone sat. She remembered the research she'd been doing earlier, specifically about the old couple who had lived here before. The articles hadn't just mentioned the woman's disappearance. They'd mentioned whispers of an ancient ritual something tied to the land, to the house. Claire lunged for the phone, her fingers flying across the screen as she pulled up the article. Her hands trembled as she read it again, faster this time, searching for the detail she had overlooked in her panic. The figure moved closer again, the oppressive darkness folding in on itself, inching toward Emily. The room felt like it was shrinking, the air thick with malevolence. Emily was shaking uncontrollably, her eyes wide with terror as the figure's shadow loomed over her, ready to claim her once and for all. Claire found the passage she had missed. The house was rumored to have been built on cursed land. Some say the original owners, in a desperate attempt to protect themselves from the spirits tied to the land, performed a ritual of banishment. It required fire, iron, and the force of will to sever the connection to the darkness. Claire's eyes widened. Fire. Iron force of will. That was it. She didn't have much time. The figure was closing in, and Emily was slipping further into the paralysis with every passing second. 
Claire's mind raced as she tore through the living room, searching for something, anything, that could act as iron. Finally, in the kitchen, she spotted an old cast iron skillet hanging above the stove. She grabbed it and hurried back into the living room, where the figure had nearly enveloped Emily completely. It was now standing directly over her, its hand reaching for her face, and the air was filled with a deep rumbling sound like the groaning of ancient stone. Claire's pulse thundered in her ears as she lit a candle, holding it in one hand while gripping the heavy skillet in the other. You're not taking her! Claire screamed, her voice trembling but fierce. She shoved the candle toward the figure, the flame flickering wildly but not going out. Leave her alone. The figure seemed to pause for a moment, as if acknowledging Claire's resistance. But then it pressed on, the darkness swirling in an almost predatory way, consuming the space between it and Emily. With a surge of adrenaline, Claire thrust the cast iron skillet into the figure's path, the iron glowing faintly in the dim candlelight. As soon as the metal touched the edge of the shadow, there was a horrific screeching sound, like nails on glass. The figure recoiled violently, its form flickering and twisting as if the skillet had burned it. Emily gasped, the air rushing back into her lungs as the dark pressure around her suddenly lifted. She blinked, her body still trembling, but she could move again. She could feel her limbs, her breath, her heartbeat. Claire, she whispered, her voice barely audible. Claire didn't stop. She swung the skillet again, the iron cutting through the darkness like a weapon. You're not welcome here she shouted, her voice breaking with emotion. This is our home, not yours. The figure writhed, its form distorting, the shadows flickering like a dying flame. It let out a low, guttural sound, almost like a growl, before the darkness began to dissipate, pulling back from Emily and retreating into the corners of the room. The temperature slowly began to rise again, the air lightening as the figure shrank away, its presence growing weaker with each passing second. Claire stood her ground, clutching the skillet, her breath ragged. She watched as the last of the shadow flickered and vanished into the walls, leaving the room eerily quiet. Emily collapsed into Claire's arms, her body shaking as tears streamed down her face. It's gone, she whispered, her voice thick with relief and exhaustion. It's finally gone. Claire held her tight, her own heart pounding in her chest. I don't know if it's gone for good, but whatever it was, we fought it off. They stayed like that for what felt like hours, the weight of what they had just survived hanging in the air. The house, now quiet and still, no longer felt like a prison. There was peace, however fragile, in the space between them. The next day, Emily and Greg packed up and left the house for good. They didn't need to explain much to the real estate agent, just that they were moving somewhere new. Claire helped them move, her presence a constant reminder of the battle they had won together. As they drove away, Emily looked back at the house one last time, watching it grow smaller in the rearview mirror. A shiver ran down her spine, but she couldn't help but feel that whatever had been haunting her, whatever had been trying to take her, had finally been defeated. But deep down in a part of her mind she tried to ignore, Emily couldn't shake the feeling that the darkness wasn't truly gone. It was just waiting for someone else. Story number two. The wind howled through the trees like a banshee's wail, its sharp fingers scraping against the old farmhouse's shutters. Lisa stood at the window, watching the dark sky churn above the tree line, feeling uneasy for reasons she couldn't quite name. The house was theirs, finally. After years of saving, dreaming, and planning, they had found this place, a fixer-upper in the countryside, far from the clamor of the city. It was perfect, or so they thought. Michael? Lisa called out to her husband, her voice barely audible over the whistling wind, in the kitchen, he responded, his voice muffled from the other room. He was unpacking the last of their belongings, setting up the few appliances they had brought with them. Lisa turned from the window and tried to shake off the feeling gnawing at the back of her mind. Just as she was about to head downstairs, a sharp knock came at the front door. Her heart skipped a beat. Who could it be at this hour? The nearest neighbor was miles away and they hadn't expected anyone. She froze, staring at the door as if it might reveal the identity of their visitor without her having to open it. Mike, she shouted, her voice tinged with nervousness. There's someone at the door. Michael emerged from the kitchen, wiping his hands on a towel. He glanced at Lisa before approaching the door. He hesitated for a second, looking through the peephole. 
Then, without a word, he opened it. A man stood on the porch, drenched from the rain, but smiling politely. He was older, maybe in his late sixties, with silver hair neatly combed back and a gray suit that looked strangely out of time. He held a cane, though he didn't seem to need it for support. Good evening, the man said, his voice smooth and calm, though there was something unsettling in its tone. I hope I'm not intruding. My name is Robert Caldwell. I believe I'm the original owner of this house. Lisa and Michael exchanged confused glances. They had bought the property from a bank. The previous owner had long since defaulted, and there hadn't been any mention of the original owner still being alive. Still, Michael stepped aside, motioning for the man to come in. Mr. Caldwell, Michael started, trying to piece together his thoughts. I wasn't aware that you were still around. I mean, we didn't get much history on the house. The man smiled, his eyes cold and distant. The history of this house is long and complicated, but it has always been special to me. I was born here, raised here. This house holds many memories. I would be happy to show you around, give you a tour, if you'd like. Lisa felt a chill run down her spine. There was something about the man, something that made her uneasy, but she couldn't put her finger on it. She glanced at Michael, who seemed more intrigued than suspicious. He nodded. Sure, we'd love that. Michael said, oblivious to the tension that had seized Lisa. Caldwell smiled wider, though his expression didn't reach his eyes. He stepped further into the house, glancing around with a sense of ownership that made Lisa uncomfortable. He moved through the rooms with an almost intimate familiarity, pointing out details that neither of them had noticed. An ornate carving on the fireplace, the way the floorboards creaked in certain spots, the hidden alcove in the hallway that led to a forgotten part of the house. This place hasn't changed much, he said with a wistful sigh. Not much at all. Lisa stayed close to Michael as Caldwell led them upstairs. The house was old, yes, but something about the way he moved, the way he spoke, felt older, like the house had preserved him along with its creaking bones. And this, Caldwell said, pushing open a door to one of the upstairs bedrooms, was my parents' room. The air in the room was heavier, colder. Lisa shivered as she crossed the threshold, feeling as though something invisible had brushed against her skin. She didn't want to go inside, but Michael followed eagerly. The house has a life of its own, Caldwell continued, his voice low, almost reverent. Some say houses like this, old houses, remember things. They hold on to them. The walls, the floors, the very air. It's all alive with memory. His words unsettled Lisa, but before she could voice her discomfort, Caldwell turned and headed toward the door. It's been a pleasure showing you around, he said. I'll take my leave now. Enjoy your new home. And just like that, he was gone. No more words, no more explanation. Michael and Lisa exchanged a look, baffled by the man's sudden departure, but more relieved than they cared to admit. That was strange, Michael said, his brow furrowed. Very strange, Lisa agreed, wrapping her arms around herself as they descended the stairs. The house seemed quieter now, more foreboding. The evening dragged on, but the sense of unease never left them. That night, as they lay in bed, Lisa couldn't sleep. Every creak of the house, every gust of wind against the window, felt deliberate, like the house itself was breathing. Then, just as she was drifting into an uneasy slumber, the faint sound of footsteps echoed from upstairs. Lisa shot up in bed, her heart pounding. Michael stirred beside her but didn't wake. She listened closely, her breath catching in her throat. The footsteps grew louder, moving down the hallway toward their room. Terrified, she shook Michael awake. Michael, listen, she whispered, her voice shaking. He groaned, still half asleep, but then he heard it too, the unmistakable sound of someone walking down the hall. Michael grabbed the bedside lamp and stood, his face pale. He opened the bedroom door cautiously, peering into the dark hallway. There was no one there, but the footsteps continued, fading down the hall toward the room Robert Caldwell had shown them, the room that had belonged to his parents. That doesn't make any sense, Michael muttered, stepping into the hallway. No one else is here. But Lisa couldn't shake the feeling. Her eyes were wide, staring down the dark corridor, her heart thudding in her chest, because she knew someone was here. The next morning, the house was eerily quiet. Michael had gone into town to pick up some supplies, leaving Lisa alone in the vast, creaky farmhouse. The events of the previous night replayed in her mind, 
especially the phantom footsteps and the strange man who had shown up out of nowhere. She tried to shake the lingering sense of dread, telling herself it was just her imagination getting the best of her. But as Lisa stood in the kitchen, sipping her coffee and staring out at the overcast sky, she couldn't help but feel like she was being watched. The uneasy feeling persisted throughout the morning. Every noise, every creak of the floorboards, every gust of wind that rattled the windows sent a chill down her spine. She kept glancing over her shoulder, half expecting to see someone standing behind her, though the house remained empty. Finally, she decided to investigate. Something about Robert Caldwell had unnerved her, and she couldn't let it go. She needed to know more about him, about the history of the house. Lisa made her way upstairs, stopping at the door to the room Caldwell had pointed out the night before, the one that had belonged to his parents. She hesitated, her hand hovering over the knob. The air here felt different, heavier, as though the house itself was holding its breath. Pushing the door open, she stepped inside. The room was cold, much colder than the rest of the house. Dust motes floated in the air, catching the dim light that filtered through the window. The bed, an old four-poster with faded linens, was neatly made, as though someone had prepared it for a guest. A sense of wrongness washed over Lisa as she stood in the room. Something about the place felt off. She crossed to the far wall where an old dresser stood, its surface covered in a fine layer of dust. She opened the top drawer, curious but apprehensive. Inside, she found something unexpected, a faded photograph. It was a black and white portrait, frayed at the edges from age. The photograph showed a young man and woman, both dressed in formal attire, standing in front of what appeared to be the very house she was now standing in. The man's face was unmistakable. Robert Caldwell, though much younger, his expression somber. The woman beside him, presumably his wife, stared blankly at the camera, her eyes hollow and lifeless. Lisa's fingers trembled as she stared at the photo. The back of her mind buzzed with questions, but before she could process them, she noticed something strange. There was a faint smudge on the bottom corner of the photograph, as if someone had tried to erase part of the image. Curious, she held the photo closer to the light, squinting at the smudge. That's when she saw it, a third figure, barely visible, standing behind the couple. The figure was shadowy, almost transparent, but distinctly human, and it was watching them. A chill ran down Lisa's spine. Her breath caught in her throat as she realized what she was looking at. Suddenly, a loud crash came from downstairs, shattering the tense silence. Lisa jumped, her heart racing. She dropped the photograph and rushed to the door, peering down the hallway. Michael? She called, but there was no response. She descended the stairs cautiously, her every nerve on edge. As she reached the bottom, she noticed that the front door had swung open, banging against the wall in the wind. The sky outside had darkened, heavy clouds rolling in. Lisa frowned. Michael hadn't returned yet, and she was certain she had locked the door after him. She moved to close it, but before she could, she heard the unmistakable sound of footsteps behind her. Her body went rigid. She didn't dare turn around. The footsteps grew louder, closer. She squeezed her eyes shut, her breath coming in shallow gasps. For a brief moment, the air around her felt electric, charged with a presence she couldn't see. Then, just as suddenly as they had started, the footsteps stopped. Slowly, cautiously, Lisa opened her eyes and turned. The hallway was empty. She exhaled shakily and shut the front door, locking it with trembling hands. The house had grown unnervingly still again, fright, the silence pressing in on her from all sides. She was about to head upstairs when the sound of a voice drifted from the living room. Welcome home, it whispered. Lisa froze, her heart leaping into her throat. She turned toward the living room, her pulse pounding in her ears. The voice had been soft, barely audible, but she had heard it. She took a hesitant step toward the room, her hand clutching the banister for support. The living room was dim, the curtains half drawn, casting long shadows across the furniture. Who's there? She called, her voice trembling. For a long moment, there was no answer. Then from the far corner of the room, a figure emerged. It was Robert Caldwell. He stood by the fireplace, his posture rigid, his face a mask of cold indifference. But there was something different about him now, something darker. His eyes, once calm and polite, were empty, void of any warmth. You shouldn't have come here, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. This house, it doesn't belong to you. 
Lisa's blood ran cold. She wanted to scream, to run, but her feet felt rooted to the floor. She couldn't move, couldn't breathe. Caldwell took a step toward her, his presence overwhelming, suffocating. Leave, he said, his voice growing more menacing, before it's too late. Then, just as he had the night before, he vanished. One moment he was there, the next he was gone, leaving nothing but an oppressive silence in his wake. Lisa stood frozen, her heart hammering in her chest. Her mind raced with fear and confusion. What was happening in this house? Who or what was Robert Caldwell? She had no time to ponder. The front door burst open again, slamming against the wall with a deafening bang. This time, Lisa didn't hesitate. She grabbed her phone from the counter and bolted out of the house, her footsteps pounding against the gravel driveway. She had to get out. She had to find Michael, but as she ran, she couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching her. She glanced over her shoulder, expecting to see Caldwell behind her, but the driveway was empty. Still, the presence lingered, heavy, unshakable. The house wasn't done with them yet. Lisa tore down the gravel driveway, her heart pounding in her chest. The house loomed behind her like a dark, silent sentinel, but she couldn't bring herself to look back at it again. She fumbled for her phone, hands trembling, and dialed Michael's number. Her breath came in ragged gasps as she waited for him to pick up. Come on, Michael, please pick up, she muttered under her breath, glancing nervously at the trees surrounding the property. The phone rang endlessly, each unanswered tone ratcheting her anxiety higher. Finally, Michael's voice came on the line. Hey, what's up? I'm just grabbing some... Michael, you need to come home, now. Lisa interrupted, her voice tight with fear. Whoa, whoa, what's going on? Michael's tone shifted, concern replacing his casualness. What happened? Are you okay? No, I'm not okay, Lisa cried, her voice quivering. He came back, Robert Caldwell. He was in the house again, Michael, and I don't know how. I don't know what he is, but he isn't normal. He's, he's dangerous. There was a brief silence on the other end of the line before Michael spoke again, this time more calmly. Lisa, I'm sure there's a reasonable explanation. Maybe we're just dealing with some crazy local who... Michael, I'm serious, she shouted, cutting him off again. He's not some crazy local. I found a photo upstairs. Caldwell's in it, but it's old, Michael. Really old. There's no way he's still alive. There was another pause before Michael responded, his tone more cautious now. Okay, okay, I'm on my way. I'll be home in 15 minutes, tops. Just stay calm, all right? I don't know if I can... Lisa whispered, her eyes darting nervously back toward the house. Please hurry. She ended the call and stood there, alone in the driveway, her thoughts swirling like a storm. The cold wind cut through her, but she didn't dare go back inside. Not with whatever was in there. Fifteen minutes felt like an eternity. Every gust of wind, every rustling leaf made her jump, her paranoia mounting. She kept her eyes locked on the narrow country road, waiting for Michael's truck to appear. Finally, she saw the headlights bouncing over the uneven road, and her heart leaped in relief. The truck pulled into the driveway, and Michael jumped out before it had fully stopped. Lisa! He ran to her, concern etched across his face. Are you okay? What happened? She rushed into his arms, feeling a brief moment of safety. I don't know what's happening, but this house isn't right, Michael. I saw him, Caldwell. He told me to leave, and then he just disappeared. Michael held her tight, stroking her hair as he tried to calm her down. It's okay. We'll figure this out. Maybe we should head into town for the night, stay at a hotel. We can come back tomorrow, and... Before he could finish, the front door of the house creaked open on its own. Both of them froze, staring at the doorway. The wind picked up, howling through the trees, but it wasn't enough to have forced the door open. Something else had done that. We're leaving, Lisa said firmly, pulling away from Michael and heading toward the truck. But Michael stayed rooted to the spot, his eyes fixed on the dark threshold. Wait, something's off about this, he muttered. If Caldwell's dead, then who did we meet? And what's happening inside? I don't care, Lisa snapped, her voice cracking with fear. I don't want to figure it out, I just want to leave. Michael turned to her, his expression conflicted. I know, but we can't just run without knowing what we're dealing with. What if there's a real person in there messing with us? We need to get to the bottom of this. Lisa stared at him, her eyes pleading. Michael, please. I don't care about the answers. I just want to be safe. Michael hesitated, but then he sighed. Okay, let's go. We'll figure this out in the morning. Just as they turned to leave, 
A sudden movement from the second story window caught their attention. Lisa's breath caught in her throat as she saw a figure standing there, staring down at them. It was Caldwell. He stood in the window of his parents' old bedroom, his face pale and gaunt, his eyes dark pits of emptiness. His lips curled into a twisted smile, and he raised his hand slowly, pointing directly at them. Lisa stumbled backward, her legs nearly giving out beneath her. Oh my god, Michael! He's up there! Michael turned, and his face went ashen. He had seen it too. Get in the truck! He shouted. They both bolted for the vehicle, hearts racing. Michael fumbled with the keys, cursing under his breath as he tried to start the engine. The truck finally roared to life, and they sped down the driveway, gravel spraying behind them. As they tore down the country road, Lisa's hands were shaking uncontrollably. What the hell was that? She gasped. How is he even here? He's dead, Michael. We know he's dead. I don't know, Michael yelled, his knuckles white as he gripped the steering wheel. But we're not going back there tonight. We need to get out of here. They drove in silence for a few miles, the tension in the truck thick and suffocating. Neither of them dared to speak, as if words would somehow make the nightmare real. The small, sleepy town wasn't far, and Lisa clung to the hope that they could escape whatever evil had taken hold of their house. But as they rounded a bend in the road, the truck suddenly sputtered and lurched. What? What's happening? Lisa stammered, panic rising in her throat. The engine gave a final cough before it died completely, leaving them in complete darkness on the desolate road. Michael slammed his fist against the steering wheel in frustration. Are you kidding me? It was just running fine. Lisa's eyes darted nervously around the empty road, her heart pounding. Please tell me this is just a coincidence. Michael tried the ignition again, but it only clicked helplessly. It's dead, he muttered, his face pale in the dim glow of the dashboard. The battery's dead. It shouldn't be, but it is. Lisa's breathing quickened. The silence of the countryside pressed in on them, the only sound the rustling of leaves in the wind, and then faintly from the woods that flanked the road, they heard it. They heard it. Footsteps, slow, deliberate footsteps growing closer. Lisa's blood turned to ice. She clutched Michael's arm, her voice barely a whisper. Michael, someone's coming. Michael's head snapped toward the woods, his face twisted with dread. The footsteps grew louder, nearer. Whoever or whatever was walking toward them wasn't in any hurry. It moved with purpose, with the knowledge that they had nowhere to go. And then, out of the darkness, a figure appeared. It was Robert Caldwell. He emerged from the tree line, his pale face illuminated by the faint glow of the moon, his eyes locked onto theirs, cold and hollow, and his lips parted in a terrible smile. You shouldn't have left, Caldwell said, his voice echoing unnaturally through the night. This house belongs to me, and now so do you, Lisa screamed. Lisa's scream echoed through the night, cutting through the eerie stillness that had descended upon them. Michael grabbed her arm, pulling her close as they both sat frozen in the truck, staring at Robert Caldwell as he stood motionless in the middle of the road. His presence was wrong, unnatural. The air around him seemed to pulse with something dark and suffocating, something ancient. Michael's heart pounded in his chest. We need to run. Now. He shoved the truck door open, yanking Lisa out with him, and together they bolted into the woods. The trees loomed around them, their branches clawing at the sky as they ran, their footsteps crashing through the underbrush. Lisa's breaths came in ragged gasps and her legs felt like lead, but she didn't dare stop. Behind them, Caldwell's slow, deliberate footsteps followed, unhurried but relentless, as if he knew they couldn't escape him. He's coming, Lisa panted, glancing over her shoulder. The sight of Caldwell's pale figure moving through the trees sent fresh terror surging through her. Keep going. Michael urged, gripping her hand tightly. They pushed deeper into the woods, weaving between trees, branches whipping against their faces. But no matter how fast they ran, the footsteps never stopped. It was as if Caldwell was always just behind them, keeping pace effortlessly, his gaze boring into their backs. The night closed in around them, the air thick with the smell of damp earth and rotting leaves. Lisa's mind raced, filled with frantic thoughts. How was this happening? How could he follow them like this? so calmly, so confidently, as though he owned not just the house, but the very ground they ran on. Finally, they stumbled upon a small clearing, breathless and exhausted. Michael doubled over, hands on his knees, trying to catch his breath. Lisa leaned against a tree, her whole body trembling. I, I think we lost him, 
Michael gasped, though he didn't sound convinced. The woods were deathly silent now, the only sound their ragged breathing. Lisa shook her head, eyes wide. He's not human, Michael. There's no way. He'll never stop. Michael straightened, his jaw tight. We'll find help. There has to be someone nearby. Before Lisa could respond, a familiar sound filled the clearing. Footsteps, slow, measured footsteps, crunching through the underbrush. Lisa's stomach dropped. She spun around, searching the darkness. The trees shifted in the wind, their branches creaking, but Caldwell's face was nowhere to be seen. Do you hear that? She whispered, her voice trembling. Michael nodded grimly. We have to keep moving. Just as they turned to leave the clearing, a voice rang out from the shadows, low and menacing. You can't run from me. This place is mine. The voice wasn't coming from behind them. It was ahead. Michael grabbed Lisa's arm, pulling her behind him as he searched the darkness. Where is he? He hissed, his voice tight with panic. The trees seemed to close in around them, the shadows deepening. Lisa felt a cold dread seep into her bones. Michael, we're trapped. A flicker of movement caught their attention. Caldwell stepped out from behind a tree, his dark eyes fixed on them, that same twisted smile playing on his lips. He looked almost amused by their attempts to escape, as though this was nothing more than a game to him. I told you, Caldwell said, his voice soft and hollow. This house, this land, it belongs to me, and you're not leaving. Michael lunged forward, desperate to stop him, but as he closed the distance, Caldwell simply disappeared. One moment he was there, the next he was gone, leaving only a cold emptiness in the space where he had stood. Michael stumbled to a halt, spinning around wildly. Where the hell did he go? Lisa backed away, her pulse racing. We need to get out of these woods. Now. They took off again, racing through the dense trees. Lisa's thoughts raced alongside her, every instinct screaming that they were running in circles, that no matter where they went, Caldwell would always be one step ahead of them. She could feel it, an unseen force pressing down on them, tightening around them like a noose. Finally, after what felt like hours, they broke through the trees and into an open field. In the distance, the faint glow of a farmhouse appeared, its lights flickering in the night. Look, a house! Lisa gasped, pointing. Michael nodded, his eyes wide with hope. Maybe someone's there. Come on! They sprinted across the field, the grass wet and slippery beneath their feet. As they neared the house, the front door swung open, revealing a figure standing in the doorway. Help us, Lisa cried, her voice breaking with desperation. Please help us! But as they got closer, the figure stepped into the light and Lisa's heart stopped. It was Robert Caldwell. He stood on the porch, his pale face expressionless, his dark eyes boring into theirs. Welcome home, he said softly. Lisa skidded to a halt, her breath catching in her throat. No, no, this can't be happening. Michael grabbed her arm, pulling her back. It's not real, Lisa. None of this is real. But as they turned to run, something even more horrifying stopped them in their tracks. The landscape around them was changing. The trees warped and twisted, the sky darkened, and the field they had just crossed dissolved into nothingness. The world seemed to fold in on itself, pulling them back toward the house like a nightmare they couldn't escape. Lisa's knees buckled as she watched in terror. Michael, what's happening? Michael held her tightly, his own fear barely contained. It's him. He's controlling everything. Caldwell stepped off the porch, his presence filling the air with an oppressive weight. You should have listened. You should have left when you had the chance. But now, you're mine. Lisa felt the world spin, her vision blurring as the force around them tightened. The farmhouse, the trees, everything began to flicker and fade, as though reality itself was crumbling away. Michael looked into her eyes, desperation etched across his face. We can still get out, we just need to. Before he could finish, the ground beneath them gave way and they plunged into darkness. Lisa screamed, the sensation of falling overwhelming her. She reached for Michael, but her fingers slipped through empty air. The darkness swallowed her whole, her mind spiraling into chaos. And then, just as suddenly, everything stopped. Lisa found herself standing in the foyer of their house, the house they had just fled. She spun around, disoriented, her heart hammering in her chest. Michael was beside her, equally bewildered. How, how do we get back here? Lisa whispered, her voice trembling. The front door creaked open and Robert Caldwell stepped inside. I told you, he said, his voice cold and final, this house is mine. And then the door slammed shut.
The slam of the front door echoed through the house like the final toll of a bell sealing their fate. Lisa's breath hitched in her throat as she stood frozen in the foyer, staring at Robert Caldwell. His cold, dead eyes locked onto hers, and the weight of his presence pressed down on her like a suffocating blanket. Michael grabbed Lisa's arm, pulling her toward the stairs. We can't stay here. We have to find a way out. But as they turned to run, the house seemed to shift around them. The walls groaned, the floorboards beneath their feet creaked and buckled. The hallway that led to the kitchen twisted impossibly, stretching into darkness, as though the house itself was alive and determined to trap them. This place, it's not real, Michael muttered, his voice tight with fear. None of it's real. Then why does it feel so real? Lisa whispered, her heart pounding in her chest. Behind them, Caldwell's voice drifted through the air, soft and menacing. You can't escape. There's no point in running. The words sent a shiver down Lisa's spine, and she spun to face him. What do you want? Why are you doing this to us? Caldwell's expression remained blank, his pale face emotionless. This house is mine. It has always been mine, and those who enter it belong to me. Lisa's stomach twisted with fear. But you're dead. You died decades ago. Caldwell smiled, a cold, chilling smile that sent ice through her veins. Death doesn't mean what you think it does. Not here. Not in this house. Michael stepped forward, his fists clenched. We're leaving, Caldwell. You can't keep us here. Caldwell's gaze flickered toward Michael, his smile fading. You misunderstand. You never left. You've been here since the moment you stepped through that door. This house, it has a way of keeping people. Lisa's mind raced, trying to make sense of his words. What do you mean? We've been here for days. You've been here far longer than that, Caldwell interrupted, his voice low and ominous. Time doesn't move the way you think it does in this place. The longer you stay, the more it takes from you, until there's nothing left. Lisa's heart pounded in her chest, panic clawing at her insides. Michael, what is he talking about? Michael shook his head, his face pale. He's trying to mess with us. We're leaving, and we're never coming back. He grabbed Lisa's hand, pulling her toward the front door, but as they reached for the handle, the wood seemed to ripple beneath their touch, like the surface of water. Michael yanked on the door, but it didn't budge. It felt solid and impenetrable, as though it had fused with the walls of the house. We can't leave, Lisa whispered, her voice trembling with terror. Caldwell took a step closer, his dark eyes gleaming with satisfaction. You belong to the house now, just like the others. What others? Michael demanded, his voice cracking with frustration. But before Caldwell could answer, a series of soft whispers began to echo through the house, growing louder and more insistent. The air around them grew colder, and the lights flickered, casting strange, shifting shadows across the walls. Lisa's breath caught in her throat as she realized the whispers weren't coming from Caldwell. They were coming from the walls, from the very structure of the house itself. She turned slowly, her eyes widening in horror as the shadows on the walls began to take shape. Figures, moving and writhing, trapped within the very fabric of the house. Their faces were pale and distorted, their mouths open in silent screams. Dozens of them, maybe more. Michael. Lisa's voice was barely a whisper. There are people here, trapped, just like us. Michael's eyes darted around the room, his face contorted with fear. No, this can't be happening. Caldwell stepped closer, his voice calm, almost soothing. This house has always needed souls to sustain it. Those who enter are never truly allowed to leave. They become part of it, just like you will. Lisa's chest tightened, panic surging through her. We have to get out of here. She bolted toward the staircase, dragging Michael with her. Upstairs! There's got to be a way out. They raced up the stairs, their footsteps pounding on the old wooden steps. Behind them, the whispers grew louder, almost deafening, as if the house itself was alive, hungry for more. At the top of the stairs, they reached the master bedroom, the room Robert Caldwell had shown them during that first night. Lisa pushed the door open, her breath coming in shallow gasps. The room was dark and cold, just as it had been before. But something was different now. The air felt heavier, charged with an unseen force. Michael rushed to the window, knife trying to pry it open. It's locked! None of them open! Lisa paced frantically, her mind spinning. There has to be a way out. There has to be. Suddenly, she stopped, her eyes falling on the old mirror hanging on the wall, the same mirror Robert Caldwell had stood beside that first night. 
the reflection in the mirror wasn't her own. Instead, she saw Robert Caldwell standing behind her, his face inches from hers. But it wasn't just him. The figures they had seen on the walls, the trapped souls, were now in the mirror, their faces twisted in agony, reaching out toward her. Lisa screamed and stumbled back, grabbing Michael's arm. The mirror! It's them! They're in the mirror! Michael turned, his eyes wide with horror. What the hell is this place? The room seemed to pulse around them, the walls warping and twisting as though the house was closing in on them, tightening its grip. The whispering voices grew louder, more urgent, filling their minds with incoherent, desperate pleas. And then from the shadows, Robert Caldwell appeared again, standing in the doorway. His eyes were darker than ever, his smile gone. There's no escape. You belong to the house now. Lisa's heart pounded in her chest. This was it. They were trapped. There was no way out. But then, something strange happened. The figures in the mirror, the trapped souls, they began to move, their ghostly hands pressing against the glass. For a moment, Lisa felt a flicker of hope. Michael, look! The souls in the mirror pushed harder, their faces straining with effort. And then, the mirror began to crack. What's happening? Michael asked, stepping closer to the mirror. The cracks spread across the glass, spiderwebbing out until the entire surface was shattered. With a deafening crash, the mirror exploded, sending shards of glass flying across the room. For a moment, the air was still, silent. Then, from the shattered remains of the mirror, a wave of icy air swept through the room, and the trapped souls emerged, swirling around Robert Caldwell like a raging storm. Caldwell's face twisted in fury, his hands reaching out as though to fight them off, but it was too late. The souls descended upon him, pulling him into the shadows, their voices rising in a chorus of angry whispers. Caldwell's figure flickered and faded, his form dissolving into the darkness. And then he was gone. The house fell silent. The walls stopped groaning, the air grew still, and the oppressive weight that had hung over them lifted. Lisa collapsed to the floor, her heart pounding in her chest. Is, is it over? Michael knelt beside her, his face pale. I don't know, but he's gone. They both stared at the shattered remains of the mirror, the room now eerily quiet. Whatever had happened, whatever those souls had done, they had freed them. Somehow, they had escaped the house's grasp. Lisa glanced toward the window and was startled to see the morning light filtering through the curtains. The nightmarish darkness that had surrounded the house was gone, replaced by the soft glow of dawn. We're free, she whispered, hardly daring to believe it. Michael stood and offered his hand to Lisa, helping her to her feet. They walked cautiously to the window, and this time it opened easily. The fresh morning air rushed in, cool and cleansing. They had made it. They were free. As they descended the stairs, the house felt different. Empty. Quiet. The whispers were gone. The house had released them. When they reached the front door, it opened without resistance. Together, they stepped outside, the weight of the past few days lifting from their shoulders. But as they walked down the driveway, Lisa couldn't help but glance at Glack one last time. The house stood there, silent and still, its windows dark and empty. And in one of those windows, she could have sworn she saw a shadow move. Let's go, Michael said softly, taking her hand. We're done with this place. Lisa nodded, turning away from the house for good. And as they walked away, the front door slowly creaked shut behind them.